start now. Hey guys, my name is Alyssa. I am the president of the UNR Students for Liberty. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Um, let me start this off by saying, how many of you guys watch the election? <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> All right, a few people. Basically, in exit polling, the number one biggest issue for everyone was the economy. And luckily, we have an expert here to talk about that today. Um, he was the director of the Center for International Trade and Economics at the Heritage Foundation. Um, he's a senior editor of the annual Index of Economic Freedom, and that's put together by the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal. He was the vice president of both the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas and Citigroup. And he's been published in Wall Street Journal, and he's appeared on the Jim Lehrer News Hour. And we found another video of you. It wasn't written in here, but we found another one of you. I think it was on Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> and right now, he's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Um, it is my honor to present uh, Mr. Gerald O'Driscoll. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you for coming. So uh, this, this isn't a class, so I'm not going to assume. I'm going to do my best not to assume a common background of everybody. Um, it's difficult not to edge into somewhat technical material because what we're talking about is a financial crisis and as soon as you start talking about, start talking about finance or financial institutions or the fi financial services industry, there's a lot of jargon and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to slip into it, but uh, you know, I'm used to classroom situations so if, uh, if I either see a puzzled face or a raised hand, I'll stop, take, I, I would say let's try to as the core talk goes along, let's make it simply informational questions. I don't understand uh, what do you mean or something, and then we'll have more than enough time for uh, discussion type questions, more substantive back and forth, although I'm not going to try to enforce the rule. Now, uh, last week in the Financial Times, uh, Lawrence Summers published a, uh, uh, an, an op ed, an opinion piece. Uh, entitled The Pendulum Swings Towards Regulation. And uh, I'll get back to the title in a second. Now, the reason I think it's interesting is, as you may remember or may not remember, Lawrence Summers was uh, the Secretary of Treasury in the second Clinton administration, and then he became the president of Harvard University and got in a little trouble, but he is still a professor at Harvard University. And, and the, the leading candidate to be the Obama Treasury Secretary. So this is very topical, and, and Summers certainly knows about this issue. So <clears throat> I, I'm just extracting a short, very short quote. Therefore, we need to reform tax incentives that encourage financial risk taking, regulate leverage, and prevent government policies that give rise to a toxic combination of privatized gains and socialized losses. Now, I find it hard to disagree with anything he said in that quote, and that's kind of his bottom punchline. And what we have had all too often and right now in uh, particularly the financial services industry is a history of privatized gains and socialized losses. So that I think that on the, the big picture issue, uh, uh, knowledgeable and people, people knowledgeable about the financial services industry, do agree a lot on, on what, what needs to be done. There's actually more disagreement on how it came about, but more, more agreement on what needs to be done. <clears throat> Leverage is when you, uh, you invest a small amount of capital, say $10, and then you borrow 100. That's leverage. You're leveraged 10 to 1 on what your own investment is. That's leverage. Uh, <clears throat> pendulum swings toward regulation. I'll tell you a little secret of, of uh, when you write for any kind of periodical newspaper. Uh, you, you write your essay, your words are your own, they may edit it, but you sign off on their edits. Uh, you have to agree to the changes that an editor at a newspaper or other kind of periodical wants to make. But you have no idea what the title of your piece is going to be. You could put a title on it, but in my experience, if you put a title on it, that for sure will not be the title that will appear in the article. At the very last minute, and the author, n neither an outside author writing an opinion piece for the Financial Times, 
nor uh, a reporter or an editorial writer at the newspaper who actually works for himself knows what the title of what he wrote is going to be because there's a person called a headline writer that decides what the headline should be. They read the article and they say, this is the important point, and they put a headline on it. Usually they get it right. Sometimes it gets a little lurid if you write for something like the New York Post. So I think that's the big picture. Uh, we ended up with a system of privatized gains and socialized losses. So what, what is um, the origin of this crisis? First of all, um, <clears throat> it, <clears throat> it was a long time happening. It was a long time getting started. Uh, I would say that it began around 2001. Uh, it didn't, nobody paid attention to it until the early part of 2007 and uh, it, some people date it from August 9, 2007 because that's when there was a run on a bank in the UK, the Northern Rock Bank, but I don't think Americans feel like that's when the crisis started. It really didn't get bad here until 2008, this year. Uh, and I say, uh, I'll, I'll explain, I'm using a paper as the basis of my talk. I wrote this paper for an upcoming uh, Cato Monetary Conference uh, that's going to take place on, on uh, November 19th. And I say that there was a perfect storm of, of bad policy, some of them very well-intentioned, but they played out in a bad way, let's put it that way. So some well-intentioned policies played out in a bad way. I'm going to focus a little bit on how monetary policy affected this, but first I want to talk about some of the other ingredients that people have talked about. One that you've probably heard a lot about is the subprime mortgages, and they absolutely played a pivotal role in this story. I mean, that's a fact. Now, the question is, how much of it was the result of, of a policy called affordable housing? That is a policy of promoting, uh, it, subsidizing, promoting by subsidizing in one way or another housing for people in, in what are called the category of low and moderate income. There's no question there, was, there were policies to do that. Arguably, they go back to the 1930s, to the Depression era. Certainly, they were in place by 1968 and 70. In 68, an institution called the Federal National Mortgage Association was privatized by uh, President, then President Lyndon Johnson in order to keep the, the debt of this institution off the books of the federal government and also, in, incidentally, to raise some money by selling shares in privatized entity. That's what became known as Fannie Mae. Uh, it was a budget gimmick <laughs> to help pay for the Vietnam War. In 1970, uh, Congress created a second like quasi-private, quasi-public institution, a privately owned institution with a public purpose, or part of what it did had a public purpose of promoting affordable housing. That was in 70. Now that's, that's going back a long time. So the policies have been around a long time. Uh, they were in the Clinton administration. Uh, there was renewed emphasis put on these policies. And, um, but that's, again, we're talking the 90s. Uh, what, what really uh, made the policy uh, have a big impact was that Wall Street figured out how to take this social goal and make money off it. Uh, up until that point, um, it was viewed as a burden by the banks that were required to, uh, to lend for affordable housing as, and by Fannie and Freddie. Uh, the mandate to Fannie and Freddie is in their charter and it says that, and I'm paraphrasing, but this is pretty close to the text, that in, in addition to this uh, purpose of fostering, generally fostering uh, a mortgage market in the U.S., the, the instant, and the charter I've read was Freddie Mac, so the instant to Freddie Mac is required to make loans to promote affordable housing, even 